Anyways, let's do this. Okay. Like Brutus? Mm-hmm. Because we're not new to this. Ugh, that's terrible. <sighs> Wasn't it? You're listening to the multiple award losing Dune Steve Audio Fiction Magazine. And now here's your host, Big Anklevich. I'm a man! I'm 40! And Rish Outfield. What you doing? I'm a grown ass man! Hi, everybody. Welcome to an episode, another episode. The episode. This episode. Of the Doonstief Audio Fiction Magazine. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rush Outfield. Thank you for joining us. Is this the new year, 2015? Yes, it is the new year. How about that? It doesn't even feel like the new year yet for some reason. I don't, I don't know why that would be. Well, it's been unseasonably warm here. Yeah, maybe that's it. So keep on generating Ma- <laughs> carbon emissions, guys. Maybe it's because of the uh, pre-recorded nature of our shows ah okay that could be it also (laughs) you're more literal minded um what kind of it's the opposite of a treat a trick what kind of trick do we have for the (laughs) uh the listeners today uh it, it was a trick to get this story to air at all i think it's been a long time coming yeah it's dated yeah it's this this story's been a long time coming but it's a it's a goodie it's a, not an oldie, but a goodie. It's just plain a goodie. It's getting close to an oldie at this point. Okay. But uh, it, if it's okay, can we give a disclaimer at the beginning of the story? Now listen, oh. what you're about to listen to, you have to make a concession. Anybody that's listening to this, you're going to have to choose right now before the story even begins. I, I, I want you to stand up where you are, open up your curtains, and choose to, to suspend your disbelief. Usually on the Dune, Steve, it, we've prided ourselves on this since we began. If we've got a story that has a child character in it, we'll try and get a real kid to do the part. And it, it was not possible on this story. So we've got an adult doing a child voice. And it's going to be jarring. I'm warning you. I tried different things. And ultimately, it was like, uh, well, we're going to have to go with that. I mean, unless you can find one of those adults trapped in a child's body who's also a voice actor who we know, it's not going to... We're not going to be able to get a child to do this. So, again, it's going to be jarring at first. You got to just choose to accept it. Otherwise, it's going to take you out of the story through the whole story. Okay. Was that an over... What's the opposite of an oversell? An undersell, I think, might be the opposite of an oversell. Uh, I I, know. I think that's that's a that's a good thing to say because, yeah, that's one of those things that we've always grumbled about on other shows. Other shows they don't go the extra mile to get the child for the child part, and it can be really jarring. Can be really frustrating to hear that. And this uh, not as jarring as this is going (laughs) to. And this time around, we went that route instead, and we'll talk about why afterwards but just to let you know it's gonna happen it's gonna be weird hopefully you'll get used to it but yeah that's the way it's gonna go tell them about the story what's the title of the story because i always mess it up i don't know that you always mess it up i think you just don't like it the title is say uncle okay say uncle by rish outfield i always mess it up because it has had other titles i want to call it baby talk right or baby's day out (laughs) <laughs> Wait, that wasn't one of the titles. Uh, baby Scott Back. <laughs> yes. Originally. That would be a good... If your last name was Back, or Bach even, you know, like like ba- you name your kid Scott, and then Baby Scott Back. <laughs> Scott Bakula, what was he called when he was a Baby Scott Bakula? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, that's a total... Uh, we're, we're getting off the topic here. We're supposed to be heading off to the story, so you can check it out. A uh, story written by Rich Outfield. It's, I think it's a really good story, and I hope you will enjoy it. But I'll let you guys decide. We'll talk about it when we get back. Baby Scott back. <laughs> Thanks, folks. We'll see you on the other side. Good luck. Say Uncle by Rich Outfield.
My sister Audrey had suddenly been called into a work appointment, and her normal babysitter had the flu, so I ended up with the two-year-old. His name was Alex, and he was a really cute kid, with a mop of curly hair and enormous eyes. But he'd never really taken to talking. Apparently he was so far behind the government provided free speech therapy for him, and some social worker came to the house twice a week to work with his mother. So, I didn't really feel like I knew him. He'd really progressed since the last time I'd seen him, and was in the back seat, babbling and almost using words. Again, it was pretty cute, but I'm not a baby guy. Hell, is a two-year-old even a baby anymore? And until they can take a dump in a toilet by themselves, I'd rather not be around them. There was a pet store on the next block, and I considered stopping to show the kid around. I had a bearded dragon that was about a foot long, and I could have picked up some jumbo crickets for her. But Audrey had hooked the boy into the car seat back there, and I was a little worried I wouldn't be able to figure it out on my own. Oh, who am I kidding? I'm lazy, and I didn't want to have to strap Alex back in there. Maybe next time, buddy, I said, glancing in the mirror. Bobby! Alex said. To an independent guy like me, babies mean responsibilities. The opposite of freedom. But again, he was so cute that I felt like indulging him. Pet store, Alex? Something, no. He said something. It could have been pet store, I don't know. But it worked for me. I signaled and pulled into the turn lane. The kid would probably enjoy seeing the fish and turtles at the pet store for a minute. And if I couldn't figure out the car seat, I'd just leave him unstrapped. I entered the parking lot and was looking for an open spot when Alex made a strange sound. It was a deep inhalation, like he had been <laughs> underwater and only now broke through. I glanced back and saw his whole body shake. It was some kind of fit, something I'd never heard of him having before. Uh, kiddo? <laughs> then the shaking stopped. And he went silent. Man. I heard him say. I couldn't help but laugh. Damn right. What was that about, little guy? He looked around him, then down at his hands. He opened and closed each one as if for the first time. Then he looked at me. Uh. He said. Who are you? I was taken aback. It was the same baby voice but he was speaking in full sentences, ones I could actually understand. That therapy was apparently working. Say that again? Who the hell are you? Alex asked me. You know who I am, I said. Come on, what's my name? The baby squinted at me. I don't... Uncle Calvin? He asked, just as clear as day. That's right, my man! Uncle Cal, and what's your name? I'm Alex Grady Jr., the baby said, pulling against the car seat restraint. How old am I? I paused before answering. He hadn't spoken like this before, and this level of progress from the last time I saw him would be nothing short of miraculous. You know how old you are, right? I held up two fingers. Two, he said. I'm three in 2015. I had no response for that. Where am I? He asked, looking around. Where are my parents? Either this speech therapy stuff my sister had told me about was way more effective than anybody would guessed, or I was dealing with something extraordinary here. Or it was a trick of some sort? A prank that- Can't you understand me? Alex asked me, his tiny hands opening and closing. His lips were moving. The voice, which was his, was coming from his mouth. Yes, yes, I understand, I said, quickly pulling up to the nearest open spot, which technically was in between two parking spots, but that didn't concern me right now, and shutting off the engine. Why am I with you? The baby asked. Your dad's at work. Your mom had to go get her recertification or something. Then, in case he didn't understand, they're both at work. Ah, he said, like a little man, then looked out the window. There were several cars in the parking lot, more than usual for a weekday morning, and the sky was clear. Holy God, he whispered. I laughed. 
<laughs> what did you say? Where are we? He asked, trying to unbuckle his seat restraint. His little fingers couldn't depress the orange button, though. They weren't strong enough. The pet store. You, uh, want to go in? What time is it, Calvin? The baby asked. It's 11.14. Hey, how long have you been able to talk like this? Alex ignored me. What's the date? March 9th. And the year? The year? It's 2014. 14? He asked. Not 15. No. Look, kiddo, the last time I saw you, you couldn't say your name. How is it you're talking all of a sudden? Alex shrugged. It seemed like a pretty mature gesture for a baby. And I grinned. Calvin, how long before I'll be with one of my parents again? It was a complex sentence. Maybe too advanced for a four-year-old, less a child half that age. We, uh... It'll be this afternoon at least when your mom gets back. Pinyin! He spat. That was more like it. Baby talk. But then he sighed. And it was such an adult sound, I had no problem believing his next words. Look, this is going to be hard to understand. But I'm not the Alex Grady you know. My consciousness is that of an adult. I've been transposed here. My mental pattern, I mean. From what you know as the future. Even though I appear to be... Dude! I exclaimed. This is just like Quantum Leap, you know? I don't know what that is. You leapt into someone else's body, like Scott Dracula used to do on that show. The baby shook his head. No, no, this is my body. It only works on somebody's own body. I am me, Uncle Calvin. Alex. Just not the Alex you ever meet. All right, I said, feeling a big grin on my face. Fair enough. I got out of the car and went around, opening his door. I pushed the orange button and got him out of his seat. He climbed out of the car and looked around. Wow, smell the air out here, he said. I started to apologize, about to explain that I had been meaning to clean out my car, or at least get an air freshener. But he had moved to the side door mirror and was peering at his face. He had to stand on tiptoe to see. I'm two? Alex asked. He put his hands in his mouth, feeling his tiny teeth. Is it a normal two? What do you mean? Just turned two? Uh, in September, I think. Small for my age? Yeah, a little, I said. So what year is it where you're from? 2041. Wow, I mused. If what you're saying is true, then then that makes us almost the same age. I'm 27, he said, staring at his stubby fingers. Wow, only two years younger than me. Wait, if what I'm saying is true, he repeated, either you believe me or you don't. Okay, Ukstals, explain to me how I'm talking to you right now. How else is a baby communicating with you? I had told you I believed, I said. What does uh, Ukstals mean? It was from a movie when I was a kid. I laughed. When you were a kid? Dude, how did you do it? I didn't create it. I only volunteered, he said. It's a new technology. Just now being developed. Nobody knows about it, and until now, it's really only been tried with chimpanzees. No shit. You know what those are, right? He asked. And before I could answer, he said, Look, I know it's hard to believe, but I assure you that- No, no, I interrupted. I really believe you, no problem. You do? The baby asked, his little brow raising. Yeah, what else could it be? Oh, all right. Then he felt his backside. Wow. What? I've got one of those things on. A baby pant. A diaper, I said, puzzled. Don't they use diapers anymore? No. No need. My mind went to a glorious future where nobody pooped and peed anymore. I wondered if I would miss that. He looked around at the trees and the grass, at the hills in the distance. Is it springtime? Not yet, 
Warm day today, though. It's beautiful, he said. And yeah, I guess it was. Yup, you picked a good day to come visit. I, I didn't pick it. The technology is new, shaky. They said I had an hour, but it could be two. Could be five more minutes. You, uh, still want to go in the pet store? What? Oh, no. I mean, yes, I'd love to go inside. Go anywhere where people will be gathered, doing the old things. But we can't. I have a mission of vital importance, and I only have an hour or so to try to complete it. All right. So, what do you want to do? Want to do? The baby looked up at me. I've got a mission. I'm not a tourist. Okay, I said, amused at being told off by someone with syrup in his hair. He climbed up into the car, then had to be helped up into the car seat. I put the chest bar down and snapped it in place. There were two other attachments, but uh, I didn't bother with them. What are you supposed to do? Please say you have to assassinate the Hitler of tomorrow or something. Not me, the baby said. But I do need to do whatever I can to prevent something from happening. Something bad. Holy shit, really? I said, less concerned than usual about cursing in front of a kid. Really? He said, and smiled. Can you help me with this? Hells yeah! I said, and ran around the car to hop in the driver's seat. Okay, where to? Do you know where Camp Willis is? Isn't that a, an army base or something? Air Force. It's the closest military installation within range. I nodded. Well, there's a recruiter station right by where I used to work. We could go down the hill. No, no. Listen, Calvin. I need to do what I can to stave off a disaster. I need to talk to someone important. Preferably someone alive in 2041. A disaster? Like an earthquake or something? You can't stop an earthquake, Calvin. Uh, it's just Cal, I said. Nobody called me Calvin. Nobody. So what? What happened? He pursed his little lips. There was something that we called the Under Siege. It was... He trailed off. I stared intently at this child, no doubt in my mind that he was here on a mission from the future. Weird when you put it that way. It was the worst thing that... Um... That's happened. He wouldn't meet my eye. A uh, siege? That's like an attack, right? I said. Something like that. And we can stop it? We can try. How? Who's responsible? He didn't answer. When does it happen? He closed his eyes. Look, I'm not supposed to reveal things about the future unless it's absolutely necessary. Why not? I asked. We're going to fix it anyway, right? Yes, but... He shook his head. We need to get to Camp Willis. Go fast as you're able. All right. I started the engine and pulled forward. And Cal? The baby said. Wear your seatbelt, okay? I didn't want to, but today he was the boss. So, tell me about the future, I said, turning down the radio. Don't turn it off, Alex said. I like that music. I left it down. It was just Creed, little man. You can do better. We drove up the road, heading toward the freeway. I'm not sure I should say too much about the future. Oh, come on. What's the future like? It's a hard place. A hard time. I... He trailed off. We were up alongside a school bus, several little kids looking out the windows at us. I glanced over to see what he was gawking at. I had hoped it was a hot chick, uh, something we'd have in common. Though the idea of a baby checking out a woman's legs or chest was kind of disturbing. Not as disturbing as the look on that baby's face right now. Hey, I said. What is it? Nothing he said, as he looked away from the bus. It's fine. He was lying. An easy read. The future can't be so bad, I prompted. If you've got time travel and stuff... That's new. 
barely past theoretical. I'm either the third or fourth person to back transpose. I laughed. <laughs> My nephew, the Buzz Aldrin of the 21st century. Who? You know, not the first guy on the moon, but right up there, you know? He didn't answer. I glanced in the rearview mirror and saw Alex looking out the window, a very baby-like expression on his face. A baby seeing fireworks or a plate of cookies. Alex? Are you... are you still here? He didn't look at me. All these restaurants. Different kinds of food. I glanced over at the Golden Corral buffet we were passing, next to the sushi place I'd never bothered to visit. Someone honked, and I realized I was drifting out of my lane. Whoops. You hungry? You want to stop and get something? He looked forward again. That would be great, but I need to make the best of my time here. We could go through the drive through someplace. Maybe eight or nine minutes. You, you still like french fries? How long will it take to get to Camp Willis? He asked, which wasn't exactly the correct response. From here, I thought. Shoot, probably a half hour, maybe longer. I think a friend of mine will be there. A baby friend? I asked, rather stupidly. No, Calvin. He muttered. I was watching the road again, but I could hear the frown in his voice. I pulled into the far lane and got on the freeway going north. I cranked up the tunes as Disturbed played their newest hit. When I heard the boy say, Oh no! from behind me. What now? I asked, craning my neck to look. I just... He grumbled. I just pissed myself. You did? Oh. There was absolutely no space between having to go and just going. He moaned. Well, it happens. Not to me, it doesn't. It's no big deal. It's embarrassing. Come on, I wet my pants a couple of weeks ago. There was silence from the back seat. Was that a joke? Yes, I lied. A joke? Anyway, I've got some clean diapers in your bag there. I'd forgotten about how that is with babies. Really? No kids of your own, then? No. Right on. Fight for freedom, I said. Don't any of your friends have kids? No, people don't. He sighed. <sighs> You're right. It's no big deal. But now I was the one who was thinking about it. So, this disaster, it, it changes things uh, for the worser? Uh. He sighed. It was an adorable sound. He couldn't help it. Imagine, Calvin, that you could go back in time and prevent 9-11 or 10-27 or the Holocaust or something. What's 10-27? I interrupted. Nothing. He muttered. But if you could stop them, wouldn't you? Is that what you're doing? Telling the military about an attack? About a plan for one, yes. If they believe me, untold numbers can be saved. What does untold mean? He fidgeted. I mean, more numbers than we know. I thought about that. I sped up a little, realizing we could use the carpool lane. And we went even faster. What happens? I asked. Don't worry about it, he said. Why? Why shouldn't I worry? It doesn't affect you. Oh. Well, that was a bright side. But I couldn't help but think about a huge disaster in America's future. And how that could change the world. If it was bad enough, like the Black Plague or the dinosaur asteroid thing, it could end America as we know it. I wanted to ask the boy about it. If it was an attack, what could we do about it? But he seemed unwilling to provide details. So I changed the subject. Uh, what's music like in your time? Different. More like it used to be, I guess. Lots of harmonicas, some guitars, usually sad songs, but hopeful, you know? I didn't know, but I nodded. And 
An SUV in the carpool lane ahead of me was going too slow, so I crossed the double line and went around them. I know you're not supposed to do that, but what the hell. They still have Lincoln Park in the future? I said, turning the radio up. They were my favorite band. A shame if they were forgotten in 20 years. Sometimes you hear the old songs, Alex said. But not too much. Mm, too bad, I said. I wondered if the band was still together in his day, or if Chester Bennington was even still alive. So, I bet it's weird seeing me looking so young. What? Oh. Oh, yeah. Am I completely gray in the future? Are you what? He asked. Or do I lose my hair? No. Don't worry about it. Do I have a lot of kids? Man, am I a grandfather by then? Calvin, I have between 62 and 75 minutes here. We've got to use my time wisely. Why do you keep calling me Calvin? My name's Cal. Alex hesitated. I guess that's what my mom always called you. No, she always called me Cal too. Sorry, he said, and started gazing out the window again. We passed a car dealership right off the freeway, and Alex stared at it, wide-eyed. I wondered if 2014 Kias and Hyundais looked old-fashioned and quaint to him, like Packards and Dodge Darts did to me. Are there flying cars? I asked. What? In 2095 or wh whatever? 2041. No, no flying cars. What do they have? I asked. Besides time travel, I mean... Which is cool, don't get me wrong, but, like, are there robots? Like, robots that look like people? Sex robots? No, and no, Alex said. Does your time still have those portable game systems? What, like Game Boys? No, they've pretty much been replaced by phones. I laughed. <laughs> oh, wow, I can't even imagine what phones can do in your time. They can call other phones, if that's what you mean, he said. Oh, yeah, well, I said, and concentrated on my driving. The exit was coming up, so I signaled and got over. Okay, I signaled after I got out of the lane, but a signal's a signal, right? Is this it? Alex asked. What? No, it's way over on Redwood, I said. We have to go through two towns, then up a road in the middle of nowhere. We stopped at a red light. How much further? Alex asked from the back. I don't know, ten miles? And how long is that? Depends. Uh, probably twenty minutes or so? He grunted. <sighs> hey, if this doesn't work out, can you come back? What do you mean? Retranspose? Back in time? Right. Well, we're not supposed to. The man who designed the system tried it twice and, well, he... He didn't come back right. Holy shit. Yeah, it's also very, how do I say, resource hungry. The procedure. So it's important I do what I can. What time is it? It's uh, 11.32. All right. I guess we'd better talk about how we're going to do this. Do what? I asked. Get onto a military base. He pursed his lips in a thoughtful gesture that was about the cutest thing I'd ever seen. I don't suppose you know how to get us in there. No. Uh, they'll stop us at the gate, I'm sure. Ask our business. And what will you say? I was uh, hoping you would do the talking. Right. He said which didn't sound impressed. I looked back at him. Look, what can I say? It'll sound crazy unless you talk. Then I guess I'll have to talk. I got an unpleasant thought. What if they think it's a trick? That you're not really a baby, that, you know, a, a two-year-old with a grown-up brain? Well, then maybe they'll shoot us. What? The men at the gate. They'll have guns, right? I guess so. I've never gone by before, I said. But that was beside the point. This is America. They don't shoot babies. 
don't they? I don't really remember what it was like back then. Wait, in the future they shoot babies? In America? No, actually. There aren't a lot of babies. Oh. The traffic was just barely moving, even by town standards. An orange electronic sign finally explained the slowdown. Main Street Concern? Expect delays. Alex read. Yeah, it's short for construction. I don't know why they do that. What time is it now? Can't you tell time? I can't see over the seat. He grumbled. Oh, it's uh, 11.40. Damn. Sorry, man. We were going to have to get off Main and take the side streets. I turned the first ride I could. This was practically residential. I decided to speed up, despite the signs. We drove two blocks and then entered a school zone. There were cars pulling out of the lot, a line of high schoolers out for their lunch hour. My speedometer dropped down to five. I'm sorry, I said. I thought... But there was nothing I could say. Traffic was unpredictable. We aren't going to make it, the boy said. And it was the saddest child I had ever heard. Like he was a real baby and his mommy was gone. No, no, we will, I said with absolutely nothing to back this up. I'll run every red light if I have to. Don't do that, Calvin, Alex said. But hey, whatever happens, we want to talk to Colonel Dite at Camp Willis. Brad Dite. His son Jules was my best friend. Okay, Colonel Dite, I repeated. Wait, he won't be a colonel now, Alex said. Shit, I'm not sure if he's even posted there yet. But he's posted there in your time? No, at another place in my time. But if we can talk to him, I'm sure he'll listen. To me or to you? Either. He's a good man. I nodded. This was a little more positive. Brad Dight, like fight. D-Y-T. You think you'll be able to convince him? Like, tell him stuff you know about him so he believes you're from the future? He said nothing for a moment. Ahead of us, cars and trucks were basically forcing their way in front of us, unwilling to let the normal flow of traffic get in the way of their trips to fast food and a little grab-assing. All right, listen, the baby said. I'm going to tell you what you need to know, in case I don't make it in time. You talk to Dite and make him understand. Use the 9-11 comparison, or whatever is relevant right now. I nodded, and for the next six minutes, my nephew told me about the Under Siege, the Yom Kippur Offensive, and the death of America as I knew it. He cried as he told me the worst part, the suffering, the residual destruction, the scar on the land. My mouth went dry. It was hard for me to process. It was just too big, too much to get my simple brain around. Why? Why would they do it? Hatred? Jealousy? Greed? Insanity? Why do people always do unforgivable things? He wiped at his cheeks. They're not exactly giving interviews about it. Now that people understand the... What do you call them? Ramifications. I remembered something my history teacher once said. If we had lost World War II... How much about the Holocaust would we know about? But here is the most important piece of the puzzle, where it could have all fallen apart had the right people known where to be. He told me of a mistake that was made in the planning, one that nobody caught, and I remembered someone talking about September 11th and how much bigger and more widespread it was supposed to be. The planes that were supposed to crash but didn't because of all sorts of factors. I guess the Under Siege didn't have any silver linings like that. As soon as I got back on Main Street, traffic was light again, and whatever construction they were doing was behind us. I didn't know what to say, so I just drove. Alex said nothing for a minute, just watched out the window as we passed a Walgreens and a McDonald's, and then a lot of undeveloped land. I realized Lincoln Park was still playing quietly on the radio. 
I tried so hard and got so far, but in the end, it doesn't even matter. I turned it off. If the baby was listening to the lyrics, he didn't show it. How far? The boy mumbled after a moment. I don't know, I said. It was up here a little way, maybe a mile, maybe five. It turned out to be two. Okay, we're here, I announced. I saw my nephew sit up straighter in his car seat, as if he were a soldier too. There was a gatehouse, and those raising and lowering barriers you always see in the movies, except these appeared to be made of metal instead of wood. As soon as my car pulled into the drive, a guard stood up from the stool in the gatehouse. It was a young woman in uniform with a hard face. She was already leaning out when I drove up, rolling my window down. Hello? I said, trying to hide my nervousness. We need to talk to someone? The guard glanced past me at the child, then at my windshield, maybe looking for a decal or a pass or something. You need directions? We're looking for Brad Dight. Uh, we need to speak with him. Brad The guard repeated Dite. the name. Is he stationed here? I don't know. Alex muttered from behind me. Yes, I said anyway. I'm sorry. No one is allowed on site without authorization. Can we get authorization? Uh, this is really important. Just a moment, the woman said, then gave me a look. Remain in your vehicle. The guard went back to her station and typed something at a computer in front of her. I couldn't see what she was typing, but she seemed to be smirking while doing it. A moment later, she lifted the walkie-talkie to her mouth and said something into it. She came out again. Yes, PFC Dite is here, but he is currently unavailable. I need to talk to him. It's a matter of life and death. And what's your relationship to him? I... His wife's name is Amelia, Alex said from the back seat. They're real close. She sang at Jules' funeral. It's about his wife, about Amelia. Tell him Amelia needs to talk to him. Why isn't she here then? She could call the main desk, ask for Sergeant Ankovich. She's pregnant, I burst out. She... She fell and hurt herself, and the doctor said she's pregnant. Alex prompted. What did he say? The gatekeeper asked me. Amelia fell down some stairs. She broke a rib, and the doctor found out she's pregnant. The guard looked from me to the baby and back. I can't let you on site. There's a protocol for all this. I understand that, but... I'll call it in. The woman interrupted. See if Private Dyke can come out and talk to you. Thank you. I'm sorry about the protocol, I said, though I didn't really know what that meant. The guard walked back to her station again, already talking on her walkie. I couldn't see her expression, but from her posture, I got a good feeling. She didn't shoot us, I said to the baby. Thank God for small favors, I guess, Alex muttered. We're lucky it was a lady guard, I said. Why is that? Do you still mistreat women in your time? I didn't know how to respond to that. Uh, never mind, I said. Though, now I was curious about the women of the future. A moment later, another soldier stepped out of the guardhouse and motioned for us to park to the right of the checkpoint. Still not past the checkpoint. He explained that he'd check under the car and asked if I would pop the trunk. I'd seen Zero Dark Thirty, so I understood. Time? Alex asked. I looked at the dashboard. It was afternoon. Uh, not much time, I said. Unhook me, would you? He asked, struggling in the car seat. Will you know when your time is up? I don't know. I think so. I pressed the orange button and helped him lift the chest bar over his head. The guard giving the car the once-over watched me suspiciously. It occurred to me that I might not be allowed past the checkpoint, but a little kid might be able to get in. What can I tell him to convince him we're on the level? Just let me talk, the boy said. Hopefully he'll be as easy to convince as you were. What will you say to him? I don't know. Not that I held his son's hand when he died. But something. He ran his hand through his hair. Something every adult does when stressed. Though I'd never seen a kid do it. I, 
I hope we don't have to waste time trying to get him to believe that part. I just hope he gets his ass over here soon, I said. Alex moved up between the seats and stood on the passenger side, rolling the window down. Okay, I'll basically tell him what I told you. The date of the under siege, the most important facts. The part about Sacramento International, obviously. I can ask for his telephone number so the next person to back transpose can get in contact. Tell him anything I didn't. The guard said he was just a private. What can he do? Whatever he can, Alex said, which didn't sound like much of an answer. I glanced at the clock again. Alex? Am I dead? I asked. Now or never, I figured. He was standing right next to me now. In the future? A lot of people are dead. I'm getting that impression. But I die before then, don't I? Yeah. He muttered. Do you even remember me? Sure. You're my favorite uncle. Yeah? He shrugged. Yeah. Vaguely. And my mom used to tell me that. So I die long before you grew up? I took a slow breath. Like, soon? No, no. You move away first. Then you sort of fall apart. Then you die. Great. You don't have to, he said, spreading his tiny hands. That's what this is all about. We're going to fix tomorrow. I like the sound of that. And I said as much. Alex looked beyond me. There he is. Shit, he looks kind of like his son. Dite was no more than a kid with a smooth face, square jaw, and crew cut. If he was a day over twenty, I'd eat my cigarette lighter. He had an expression on his face that I couldn't read, but he didn't look pissed off. He glanced at me, then walked over to the soldier who'd examined our car. I heard him tell the guard, Just take a minute. Then he came over, slowly, suspiciously. He approached my window, reminding me of the two dozen times I've been pulled over by cops over the years. <laughs> Alex gasped again. I tensed, afraid Dite was about to pull his gun. But on closer inspection, I saw he didn't have a sidearm. Okay, what is this? The young soldier asked. Who are you? It was time to start talking. I... <laughs> Alex gasped a third time. What was it now? I looked over. He was holding his stomach with his little fingers in a gesture that was easy to read. His stomach? Alex? I don't know you, mister. Dite said beside me. What's this about? Alex, say something. But Alex wasn't talking. He stood there and shivered. He was in pain or something. I put my hand on his back. Kiddo. Then he stopped shaking and looked over at me. On his face was a bit of confusion, but that went away when he recognized me. He was a baby again. Shit, I mumbled. What? Dite asked, his voice raising in pitch. W what's going on? I was on my own in this. Look, I have a message, I said to him, swallowing. An important message from the future? Brad Dite squinted at me, no change in his expression. What did you say about Amelia? Amelia's your wife, right? No, Amelia's... Hmm... He sighed, a sound not unlike the one Alex made when deciding whether to trust me or not. Amelia was a girl I dated two years ago. We broke up. I haven't spoken to her in a long time. Oh, I whispered. Well, that wasn't good. Alex began fiddling with the radio. I pulled his hands away and put him on my lap. I wish you had hurried... This is Alex, and he was saying some incredible stuff. Stuff about the future, Dite said. It wasn't a question. Yeah, he was... You probably won't believe me, but Alex had himself from the future talking through him. Talking like a normal person. But now he's a little kid again, Dite said. Again, not a question. 
He had traveled from the future, t telling me about a disaster you're supposed to prevent. Traveled from 2041, Dite said. My mouth opened, but nothing came out. Dite began to laugh. <laughs> uh, what? Two days ago, I was in town getting groceries when, all of a sudden, I found myself in the car driving to Boulder, Colorado. He laughed again. <laughs> I was on the phone at the time, on the phone with Amelia, that ex-girlfriend of mine. I don't understand. I didn't either. Apparently, I had just called her up and told her that in the future, I would realize that she was the one. The one that got away and everything, but that it would be too late to do anything about it. In 2041, she was out of reach, but in 2014, I would do or say anything for another chance with her. She told you this? I said. I realized I was beginning to smile. She told me I had told her this, except that I had talked like it was 2015, not 14. I looked down at Alex, but he was no longer following the conversation. I nearly turned the car around, got back here, convinced I had drank something and blacked out, but Amelia kept talking. She told me I told her something I'd never told anyone before about her. About still loving her, and about beating myself up because I'd been too much of a, you know, pussy to let her know. But I said it then, apparently. Okay. And she got in her car and met me halfway. I think she was trying to convince herself that what had happened was real, and she ended up convincing me. I didn't even care, because when I saw her, everything was right again. Everything in the world. I felt my cheeks burning. I didn't really know why. The stranger made a sound, a cross between a chuckle and a <laughs> sniffle. <laughs> so when a minute ago, I heard that Amelia was pregnant, that my wife, Amelia, was pregnant. I had to get out here and find out if it was happening again. He looked at the child on my lap, playing with the turn signal. <laughs> Looks like I just missed it. Alex told me there were other time travelers before him. Guess you were one of them? <laughs> the soldier snorted, then smiled. It was a nice smile. <laughs> I guess so. Look. I can't let you on base, but I think we can walk around out here and talk for a while. It's chow time anyway. All right, I said, shifting the baby on my lap. I've got to go over and clear it. Sit tight. All right, I said again, trying to organize what I was going to tell him when he came back. What? The baby shouted from in front of me and jumped to a standing position, giving my nuts a healthy stomp. I didn't get mad, though. Instead, I hugged him tight and kissed his little head. My nephew, the 21st century Buzz Aldrin. Won't you come baby, home, build baby? Baby, baby, kiss baby, the baby. baby, baby Melancholy baby baby's fish, mouth. Baby, baby fish, baby fish mouth. Uh, baby Marmy. fish mouth. Baby, baby, I'm crying, baby. Kiss ba the baby. Uh, baby spitting up. Exorcist baby. Die, baby. baby. Yes, sir, that's my baby. No, sir, don't mean maybe. That's it, time's up. Baby talk. Baby talk. That's not a saying. Oh, but baby fish mouth is sweeping the nation. <laughs> okay, everybody, welcome back. Hopefully you enjoyed our little tale. Baby Scott Back by Rish Outfield. Wait, no. What was it called? Say Uncle by Rish Outfield. Baby Fishmouth. <laughs> Baby Fishmouth is sweeping the nation. Boy, where do we begin? I know we don't have a tremendous amount of time to record, but there are a couple of things I do. Wanna... I think the first thing we should begin with is the cast list. Oh, okay. That's fine. <laughs> so I believe you're the narrator and the main character. Okay. Cal, Uncle Cal. Cal Drogo. Mm -hmm. And Abigail Hilton played the uh, the guard at the gate post. Uh-huh. And 
Tobias Queen. Oliver Queen. <laughs> Why do I call him Oliver Queen? I don't know. There's no good reason for it. Oh, wait. And Tobias Queen was the private, the young uh, soldier. I think his name was Deet or Diet. Oh, uh, yeah. Diet. Diet. There Dite. we go. Uh, that was the cast list. I, you forgot to mention what Rich Outfield played. <laughs> Shoot. I, 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 I think I played the part of the producer. Of this episode. <laughs> okay, so we promised that on the other side we would talk about why Rish Outfield plays the child, the little child that shall lead them in this story. Because, yeah, normally we get somebody else to do that kind of stuff. Why don't we have your nephew do those lines for us? It, it's mostly because of the way the part is written. The character is an adult in a child's body, speaking through a child. And he has to speak as an adult and it has to be an adult performance. And that, see, that's why I put the disclaimer at the beginning. Because if it bothers you, the weirdness of... What I did. And, and I understand if it does. But if it bothers you, it's going to be harder for you just to buy it and let the story speak to you. If, if there's any laughs or any emotional arc in the story... You have to get past the fact that we got a grown up doing a silly voice. And and way, way back when I was first wanting us to do this episode, this story in an episode, I put it out there. I tried a couple of different ways of altering. I, I tried doing and I can't really do it because I'm getting over a cold. But I tried to do a baby voice or whatever without altering it in post at all. I'm doing it. I'm going to talk with big anklemates in this voice or whatever. And I said, well, guys, what, what sounds better? What, what, you know, me doing this voice that I'm doing right now, only I pitch it up. Or me doing a baby voice. And, and I couldn't frankly tell because it's in my own head. Uh huh. I hear me doing the baby voice and it sounds fine to me. But it could be infuriating for somebody to listen to. I mean, you've, we both listen to audiobooks where somebody does a voice like that and you're just like, or I'm just like, no, no, <laughs> no. And, you know, I drive into a lamppost. And so, yeah, I was, I was worried about it, especially when I was editing it. And, and here's the other thing. I wrote this story. Jeez, we're going on three years ago now. I wrote this story more than two years ago, set in the far future of 2014, which is now the past. <laughs> I wrote it about March 2013. We recorded it in July or August of 2013. And then it just sat for a, almost a whole year, for more than a whole year. I got Abby to do her lines and she sent them to me. And we got Oliver Queen to come down from uh, <laughs> Sapphire City or what's it? Starling City. Starling City. City. And uh, Tobias also sent us his lines. And they just sat. And a part of it was just I was afraid to do it. I was afraid what if people don't like my story? You know, the, yeah. the crap I always go through. You don't think you could take that kind of rejection? And I guess I didn't. But you had mentioned it, and I don't know when you mentioned it. Maybe it was the last time I was here. It was a couple months ago that, you know, hey, you were supposed to have done that a long time ago. You, you Should we give it to somebody else? Justin Charles always wants to produce. Why don't we give him that? And if I was like, oh, no, Big is going to take it away from me. Because I have done nothing with it. And so I sat down and I forced myself to finish the production. And, I, you know, I feel bad. Because it is. It's supposed to take place in 2014 and it's now 2015. We didn't get it out there. And the I wrote this story when my nephew was just barely baby talking. And, and he was... He, he had some kind of learning disability. He, had, he was diagnosed with speech problems and they they sent him to a speech therapist and, and he had to take classes or whatever they call it courses you know to try and get him to talk like a normal person because every at the point where everybody is speaking in full sentences he was still babbling and you didn't understand any that he says and, and now it's two years later and it's still sometimes difficult to understand what he says although he does speak in full sentences and it is english but at that time, when I found out, you know, I was like, oh, the reason he's not talking is because there's something wrong. It bothered me. It was like, you know, the closest that I've had to a son was this kid. And uh, I was driving around with him one day and talking and he was, you know, making noises in the back, you know, just babbling. You hear some of it. 
I think, in the story of me imitating him. And then I thought, wouldn't it be neat if suddenly he started speaking like perfect English back, back there in the back seat, if full sentences and all that. And I'm just blown away. And I was like, how long have you been able to do this? And he's like, you know, all the time I've been, I've been fooling the grown up <laughs> and all that. And we have all these conversations. And then when I get back around my sister, his mom, he's baby talking again and nobody believes me. This is where this came from. We were just driving and I imagined that. And my mind started to make different connections. And I was like, what, what, what if? It was some kind of temporary thing and somebody was speaking through him and it wasn't the boy. And, and, and this story was born. And uh, it was an easy story to write. Frankly, it was an easy story to produce. I was just scared and lazy. But the, the, oh, the only hard thing about this story, was, besides the title, obviously, <laughs> it was called... Baby Talk. Baby Talk for a long time. Yeah, see, that's why I always want to call it that. And say Uncle is not similar to Baby Talk when it comes no, down to it. it isn't. And so that's why I'm always... You know, at a loss when I'm like, oh, that the the story with the baby and it has a title and it was about a baby, but now it's not. So, yeah, the title Baby Talk, it, it, it might even be this notebook right here that I brought. No, this is a 2014 notebook. It was called Baby Talk. I, it was written there at the very beginning, right before I'm driving with my nephew. Mm -hmm. And it seemed like a fine title and then i started to think about it and i said no this is too obvious this is a stupid this is insulting this is look who's talking without the cleverness of the title look who's talking F and and uh, baby talk no one no one says that that's, that's not a, a saying that's not a saying <laughs> so i came up with generation gap i thought that would be fine but it's not. It, it that generation gap doesn't really. Well, does it? Does it service this story? It could probably, because there's the generation flip flop kind of thing going on there. Yeah, uh, and I don't know why I I discarded generation gap, and I tried baby on board because of the irritating yeah. things that they had. I think I remember the baby on board being a title of it for a while too, because that's. I remember there being two baby-centric type titles, and that's why I always think baby when I go to say the name of this story, and I'm always wrong. And, yeah, there were there were others, too. I made a whole list. A conversation piece was one. And ultimately, I thought, well, I'm just going to do Say Uncle uh, because it's a pun. And I don't like puns, and I'm just going to go out there and I'm going to do one. <laughs> because it, it, you know... It's told from the uncle's point of view, and I don't know. I, I, I'm i not entirely satisfied with Say Uncle as a title, but that's what it is. At least it has been since 2013. Anyhow, the, 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 the only thing that was difficult about this story was tone. Because I kept wanting to put jokes in there. I kept wanting it to be very, very funny and to have the baby say things that would be amusing in a movie to hear a baby say. You know, a joke in it up of, of, of what a loser the, the uncle is and an idiot. And, and, and now now that it's been all this time since I wrote it, I wish that I had played that up. I wish he had been a little bit slower and that maybe he had been a stoner who was just, you know, he accomplished nothing. All he lived for was just to get high. And, and then this kid opens his eyes to the future is the future. a dark place the future is an uncertain place maybe you should prepare yourself for the future maybe you should change i don't know you in the future the tone of the story was really really difficult because this is a dark story it may not have come through because i tried to pay, play down the darkness and i tried to play down the lightness so like the silliness of the boy chastising the adult for the way he drives and the way that he acts and and you know and <laughs> calling him a dumbass and all that stuff. That's all gone. But the truth of what world this kid comes from and how awful it is, is gone too. Um, you know, he comes from a world where the human race is sterile and there are no more children. We're all doomed. And he's never seen kids playing or a place where you can go get burgers or hope. In a place where you can get burgers and hope. 
synonyms. <laughs> Sorry. I, they, they, I, they, they go I hand ruined, in hand. I ruined the tone of your speech. And, and I wanted to convey that. And I, I, I had come up with what happened and how it happened and who attacked us. Everything but why, really. And the why is obvious, too. But I felt like it would be better if the audience could just imagine and we don't spell it out and we don't say who our enemy is and we don't say I'm blown away by the things that I'm seeing because all of it is gone. I, I just I, I, I wanted to kind of dance tiptoe around all that and have it just be a fun story, but not too fun. And what happened to the uncle, I think should be clear from the story as well but that's not spelled out either and i and i don't know i'm too close to it even now when i was editing it it had been over a year since we recorded it uh -huh. and so i was able to have some things hit me where i was like oh maybe i should have rephrased that you know I'll maybe say uncle isn't the best title that kind of <laughs> stuff but there were times when i was like oh I wonder if the audience understands why he says this and all that stuff. And, and I don't know. It's, it's I'm, I'm not a subtle person, really, as you know. I tend to be over the top and I tend to enjoy, like, fart jokes. And uh, people have criticized me because I like the word f and all that. You know, I'm not a subtle person. But I tried to be subtle in this. Anyhow, that was my issue of tone. And, and tone is hard. And, I mean, you can tell me or, or the listeners can tell me if I nailed it. If I should have milked the pathos more or if, you know, I should have kept it and made it even lighter. I don't know. OK, now I'm going to turn it over to you. Yeah. You don't even remember the story. That's why I'm talking. <laughs> Obviously, as we always say, it would be cool to hear your opinions on the story. In the comments, we've got the, the forum with we'll have a post for this and uh, you can get on there and, and say what you think about that. Now, I have a question. This is on the same... I mean, this is about the story, but it's kind of taking us away from the train, the track that you were on with your train. Oh, the train of thought, you mean? <laughs> right. It's, it's a different uh, thing. But you have in your story a guard that comes to the car and talks to him before they go to see the uh, private dite. Yeah. The guard is played by Abby Hilton, and uh, originally, like you'd normally think, oh, guard is, this army guy is a man, is what you had originally put in there, and and you changed that away to a woman guard. Do you remember why? Well, it happened in the rewrite that I did right before we were going to record this. I can't remember why, it's just trying to be diverse, trying to make it less of a sausage party. I mean, the stuff that I write for you and me... <laughs> is always about two guys, whether they're in conflict or whether they're best friends or whatever, because it's that's what we do. Right, because the I, two of us will be playing them on the sh audio version. So. And I knew that was going to happen with this one, too. I knew I was going to be the kid, and you were going to be the adult, just because wh why wouldn't we? Right. I mean, unless we could get Renee Chambliss's kid to be the kid or whatever, but he's 10 years too old, or would have been back then in the 1500s when I wrote that. <laughs> and so... I don't know. Uh, can you remind me? Well, I, uh, I'm i not sure if this is it or not, but I do know that you did want to talk about this at one point. There was, uh, I want to say a blog post or something like that, in which Gina Davis was talking just about the general habit of people in Hollywood. I guess people have gone through and like, freeze-framed movies and and counted up the people in crowd scenes or something like this I'm not sure how they went about doing this but they determined that crowd scenes tend to be i, th I want to say it was two-thirds male or more just in general and that incidental and you know these small characters that come up such as the guard at the gate often tend to be male just because that's what people think it's, I guess, you know, years of history or whatever. Soldiers are men, and people just think that. And Gina Davis was just saying, hey, let me just ask you guys who are writing stuff to, to try this. Just go through and change a bunch of your characters from male to female. And when you say there's a crowd that's out there, write specifically 
that it is a crowd that it is 50% female. Because if you specifically say this, the casting director will find a crowd that is 50% female. But if you don't specifically say it, then it'll be two-thirds male like all the other crowds are, always. Yeah, okay. Let me uh, mention that. Yes, I worked on a show called Commander-in-Chief where Gina Davis became the first female president. And uh, I let her read Say Uncle back when it was called Baby Talk. And this inspired this entire <laughs> A diatribe that she... So anyways, no, yeah. No, no, it, this, this Gina Davis thing came after I had arbitrarily changed the male character to female. But it made me sit up and say, holy cow, Big, look at this. We're supposed to change... We're supposed to arbitrarily change our male characters to female. We need to do an episode of the That Gets My Goat about this. And we need to call Abigail Hilton and have her talk about this because... She had written a, a novel, I believe, with a female protagonist and then arbitrarily changed it to a male one. And I thought this is going to be fascinating to have uh, an actual woman on the show, uh, to have a different point of view. And we can all talk about this and I'll do everything. I'll take a quaalude before so I'm not screaming because this conversation, this subject makes me want to scream. And I do remember screaming at you over the phone <laughs> When you shared this Gina Davis article with me, but uh, if you remember it differently, if, if if the Gina Davis article actually made me change a male character to female, then well, I, I then good for me because I, I am open minded and progressive, <laughs> but I am not. So I just remember it happening around the same time, and that kind of being uh, something that came up. And it's something that I've tried to pay attention to ever since I've seen that. It's just because the other thing that she said, you know, arbitrarily change these people from male to female because if nothing else, it'll make your character more memorable. If your fireman is a firewoman, then people will be like, oh, wow, that's something new. That's different. That's not like every other fireman show that I've ever seen. Or, you know, your policeman is a policewoman, et cetera, et cetera, all the way down the line. You it's know, the if you, father in your story is a woman. <laughs> if you change it. It'll be something that makes your characters more memorable and makes them more interesting, and it will do that. And if it were a screenplay that were to go into production, which is something that you and I will never write, then there would be parts for women to play. And I'm sure women character actors probably have a harder time finding jobs than male character actors because of just that general, oh, yeah, there's a policeman, he comes in and he does this stuff. And yeah, since then, and probably even before that, I, I've thought about that, and we've talked about that, and considered that, and I want to say there was a few times recently where I've done that just on purpose. I took a character that would have been probably a male character and changed that, just to make it more interesting and different. Or I've taken a character that would have been a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant man, and made them a Pakistani uh, Muslim... Uh, anyways, I'm sure to think of the opposite or the difference from all of the uh, four letters of Wasp. Well, you and I both did that in the past year with stories. And I th I thought up until now that we had done it independent of one another. But maybe it was because of this conversation that we had. Nobody likes to think that they're biased or they're, they're bigoted or that they're small-minded. And so it's very well may be that in the back of my mind, it's like, well, why not? Yeah. Why not have the main character be a girl instead of a boy? Or yeah. why not have her be a person of color or have a, an effed up spelling in her name? That's you, sir. <laughs> and, and so, Spell her name with an X instead of a CK. But you and I both have done that. And, I, and I'll, I'll try to continue to do it. And, you know, see, I apparently I don't know how good that I have it being a dude. But, you know, I could be, I could play a policeman or a Secret Service agent or a news copy boy or a truck driver or whatever when I was in L.A. And I, it never even occurred to me that I may have more opportunities than a woman who was trying to get parts. And so, yeah, it's just, I didn't know I had it so good. And, and as a screenwriter, I, I, did, I wrote a screenplay that nobody's ever seen except for the guy who was trying to buy it. And it had an FBI, young FBI agent on his first assignment investigating this mysterious death of a prominent citizen in some little town. And uh, 
yeah, for some reason, I thought it would seem different. It would, it would change the story if that FBI agent was a woman. And so in the second draft, I turned him into a her. But you can't arbitrarily do this. It changed everything. Every conversation that she had, like with the sheriff, the sheriff originally welcomed this young guy into the town and said, you know, I'm not going to step on your toes or anything like that. I just like anything you need, I will, uh, I'll help you out with. If, if, in fact, I'll take a step back and you just let me know if you need something. And to show that this is, the sheriff was not the stereotype that you see in every movie. It was like, oh, the feds come in here. This is my town. You can't tell me what to do in my town. But when it became a woman, suddenly him saying, I'll just take a step back here and anything you need, if you need something, it sounded like he was pandering. It sounded like he was talking down to her, maybe wanted to slap her ass or something like that. And I was like, whoa, that's weird. The exact same sentence feels different now that it's a woman. And so, you know, I had to make little shifts and changes here and there that beyond just he said to she said. So that's, I mean, again, this should have been a That Gets My Goat episode because I'd love to hear what Abby would say. Well, maybe we can still do it with Abby later. Because we, we talked about years ago, maybe it was when she was here and we talked to her. Is like, why are you Abigail Hilton and not A.W. Hilton? Because surely you would sell more copies of your book if you're A.W. Hilton. Or Paris Hilton, <laughs> and uh, probably it's Paris just Hilton. you know it's an it, it's 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 a question that has to be answered, and a question of how what can you do about it too that has to be answered. Well, yeah, I don't know. I I was just interested in that change. Well, do, does it change, Baby Fishmel? That's not a saying. If it's a woman at the gate rather than a dude at the gate, because the change inspired one new line that wasn't in the first draft. Which is the, you say, well, it's good that it was a woman. She's going to let us in. And the boy says, what, do you still mistreat your women in, in this time? Like, I, I thought you guys were better than that or whatever. That that line came from the gender change, but nothing else changed. Yeah, I, I don't think that it changes anything. I think that it works just fine the way it is. There wasn't any lines that came across as weird or anything like that as far as that goes. The thing that I think about, and this goes way back to early times of the Dune Steve, but uh, we did a story, and we actually didn't do it for our show, but it started a friendship that caused many stories that came on our show. We did a story for Starship Sofa that was called When Thorns Are the Tips of Trees. Is that Jason Sanford? Jason Sanford's story. That was the first time that we came in contact with Jason Sanford, was doing that story for Starship Sofa. And after that, we asked Jason if we could do some of his stories for our show. And he sent us several over and we did them uh, over a period of time. And, you know, everybody always looked forward to the next Jason Sanford story because he does great stuff. Um, and one thing that I thought was interesting with that story, and both of us, I think, noticed it and wondered if it was done on purpose or if it was just uh, no big deal or you know it just happened that's the way it was or what the deal was and we even asked him about it unfortunately i have no I, I don't remember what he said i think he did say that he did it on purpose um or at least some of it was done on purpose but in this story all the characters that were these kind of supporting role characters there was a sheriff there was a doctor other people along those lines in the small town where the stuff was going on in this story and every time, it was always a female. The sheriff was a female, the doctor was a female, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. You know, this was five years ago. This was way before we read any Gina Davis article or anything else. Um, it seems to me like feminist issues have become a much more forefront type thing these days. And maybe that's not the case for everybody. Maybe it's just the particular friends I have on Facebook or something. I don't know. But a lot of these things seem to be bigger deal, more in the public eye recently, five years ago, much less so. And uh, yeah, when we saw that, we, we were like, each time, it's always a female. That's interesting. And so we asked him about it. And I think ever since then, I, I've kind of thought of, along those lines, oh, maybe I should do that. Maybe I should just, you know, turn these stereotypes on their heads, change things around, make them different. Uh, one of the things that I have noticed when I write stories is I try to make things the way I wish things would be. So a lot of times <clears throat> there'll be characters that are 
the female sheriff or the to the person from you know a, with a with a different kind of last name an ethnic sounding last name or whatever but i try to make that no big deal everybody treats that person exactly as they would anybody else you know an american is an american because that's maybe it's the way i want it to be or maybe it's the way that things could be or even are in some circumstances i don't know but uh, i think it's neat to do stuff like that i know that being a white guy sometimes when i try and write these people i get that i do it wrong you know what i mean because i don't have the experience i grew up as a white guy and white guy america and i'm sure i mess things up when i try to write from a female perspective or i try to write from a minority perspective or something like that i guess the best i can say is that i'm trying <laughs> and well, yeah. hopefully people can take that into account i'm from <clears throat> the school of thought that is better to try and fail than not to try at all and yeah i think i had been writing for 10 years or more before i ever had a a story with a female main character, you know, as the point of view character, because it was just so much easier to just, it's a man or it's a boy or it's, a, it's an old dude. It's a, it's an alien with a, a schlong. <laughs> and it was not in within my comfort zone. I was like, Oh shoot. What if somebody reads this and you know, they, they know that I'm a man or a man child. Really? <laughs> uh, I'm a grown ass man. <laughs> yes, I am. I know you're going, I don't want to hear it anymore about grown ass men. Uh, that's what I hear. You know, I've done it a lot of times now, and the only stumbling block now is that I realize, well, I'm going to have to ask, like, Renee Chambliss to read the, the audiobook <laughs> version now. But it, it's always good to try something else and try something new. I remember in your story about the Yo Gabba Gabba monster, his wife was of Indian descent and she had an Indian last name, but they never really talked about that. Oh, she had just gotten off the plane and you know, there was an arranged marriage or, you know, <laughs> their, their parents ran a convenience store or any of these things that maybe are offensive. I, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but you no, know, she was just a person. She was just his wife. She was an American who happened to have a, a, a different ethnic origin. I, it's just so weird because uh, uh, race is a big deal right now. I mean, it's always been a big deal. Our whole lives and our parents' lives, it has been too, but it's, it's a, it's a, a sticking point. And it's, you know, a lot, a lot of, you know, there's a lot of tension about it. And, you know, I try, you try, and it's good to try to put your head in somebody else's shoes. But when it comes down to it, we're both white dudes and that's what we know. And so, I, uh, Gina Davis probably has a point. I mean, it, I, I remember part of that article being she said that, you know, more than 50 percent of people are women. And yet almost all of the parts are written for men. That's not fair. And my initial reaction was, well, almost all of the people that make movies are men. So, of course, they're going to be. But she's not saying this is how it is. She's saying this is how it should be. And so uh, that I can get behind. I, I I should not have screamed at you all that time. <laughs> it's all right. The, my ear did stop ringing a couple of days later, and uh, I regained full hearing in the ear, so I'm okay. I, I, I may not get some of the really low register stuff anymore, but... Is that tintinitis, is what they call that? <laughs> that was kind of a large tangent away from what we were talking about to begin with. Well, that's all right. That's something you wanted to talk about. The thing that I wanted to talk about was the tone of the story. But there are other things that we can talk about. I mean, the, the just, just the whole time travel thing. We always talk about time travel because I love it. And you've written time travel stories and I've written time travel stories. And I will continue to do so because it, it's just fascinating to me, the whole the, the potential for time travel. And, and uh, we ran a story. What was it? Switching? Not too long ago. That uh -huh. wasn't dissimilar to this in a way. Yeah, it was more of a, not so much a time travel, but a body switching oh, you're right. story in general. But this one was a body switching time travel story, if that makes sense, adding them both together, which is a, a concept that really fascinates the crap out of me. I just finished a story that's called Do Over, 
which I don't know. I, I think I had already had the idea for do over about the time that you at least around that time, if not before that, that you had your idea for baby fish mouth. Then you explained your idea and where it came from. And it obviously didn't come from <laughs> wasn't like one in the same hand in hand. I know that we talked a lot about the idea of going back in time and waking up in your body with the memories from the future, but just, you know, the body from the past that you're in and, and in the time of the past. Well, you and I, as a broken mirror experiment, both wrote a time travel story. And the assignment was a guy travels back in time and ends up killing himself. And my story was called I'm Wishing. What was your story called? Euthanasia. And we both did. It was one of those rare. No, it wasn't rare. But I mean, there's many failed experiments where we're <laughs> like, we're going to do a broken mirror. But we both sat down and we both did it. And it just came from all of the times that we've talked about time travel. We've gone for a walk and we're just like, oh, would it be neat? And it occurred to me, I just could, I, I couldn't remember anybody ever going back in time and saying, there's me as a five-year-old boy. Bam! Because, holy cow, why would anybody do that? And scene. You know, it's like, come up with a reason why somebody would do that. And, and so, I mean, that was really fun. I mean, I, and you just wrote Do Over, and yeah, you're going to be writing uh, another time travel story, if you haven't already. Maybe for our whole lives we'll be writing time <laughs> travel stories. And, and is it just us, or is everybody? Does time travel speak to everybody? The chance to go back and fix something that you did wrong. Yeah, I think it speaks to a lot of people. Maybe not everybody, but a lot of people it definitely speaks to. The, the chance of doing something different or fixing something that went wrong or just getting involved in hijinks. I don't know. It's uh, it's just one of those things that there's always some kind of time travel story. And it's, if there's a fantastical element to a TV series, there will eventually be a time travel story as one of the episodes. Well, yeah. And my, my favorite time travel movie uh, is Back to the Future. And that started out with Robert Zemeckis going to or looking through an old yearbook and he saw a picture of his dad when his dad was his age. And he thought, if I went back in time and met my dad when we were both in high school, would we have been friends? And that's what Back to the Future came from. You could make a totally different movie yeah. about going back and meeting your dad when he was in high school and would you be friends and, and maybe somebody should, because that's still a cool idea. It I mean, is. totally divorced from Back to the Future for a movie of maybe bonding with your old... Maybe the, the George McFly, Marty McFly thing in Back to the Future ultimately is kind of a small part of that movie. Right. It could have been a much bigger deal. They, they chose to focus more on Marty and Doc, which was probably a good idea, but... And Marty and Lorraine, too, was a much bigger part as well. Anyhow, I, I mean, what's your favorite time travel movie? Uh, you know, my favorite is A Kid in King Arthur's Court. <laughs> oh, sorry. I didn't see that you were drinking. <laughs> yeah. No, that's that's that's, that's just back to the future. About similar in, in awesomeness, I would say. Uh, you know, <laughs> no, a funny thing is that when I was in high school, in, I want to say it was ninth grade, English class, you had to read uh, The Odyssey. So as like the project or whatever that you had to do was a film, you could do a video that had something to do with the Odyssey. And of course, we decided to do a time travel movie and uh, we called the movie Killing Time. Yeah, in this movie, Achilles and Odysseus get a time machine and <laughs> come forward to the present time and do stuff and have adventures and then eventually go back to the past and then the next year we found a way to make a sequel to that movie for a different class where we had to do a film and then in our senior year we made the finale of this trilogy and <laughs> we made yeah three killing time movies in the end it kind of turned out to be kind of like time cop Achilles and Odysseus became like these people that traveled time to stop this other person that had a time machine and he would like try and go and cause trouble in the past or in the future or wherever. 
and they were like the cops that would go around and stop stuff. I always wanted to kind of do something with that idea. I tried to make a general movie where there was just a whole bunch of these kind of time cops and there were various people from past and the future and so forth and could be fun but well there's a desmond warzel story that's kind of about that and i don't really know him but i was going to email him and ask him if we could do that story at our next time we get together with a bunch of people as a live reading but but yeah maybe uh we will do that on the show and we can continue this time travel conversation because again I mean, we could have a podcast that's nothing but time travel stories, and it would be, you know, we'd have to change the tone, like we were saying in this, from week to week, so it's not always, you know, the same exact take on time travel. But, I mean, there's as many takes as, as you can do of anything. Yeah. Uh, but to, Yeah, I mean, well, we did, I didn't even talk about Unidentified Flying Oddball, which is probably my second favorite time travel movie. <laughs> Oh, shoot. Wait. If you'll give me a second to take a drink, I... Uh... Uh, anyhow, this story uh, that, that, you, that you heard a long time ago before we started talking was fun to write, and I, I, I like the story. And mostly it's just because growing, uh, living with a child, as a, uh, living with a baby and seeing him grow up has been an, a unique experience for me. I mean, because when my sister was a baby... I was a kid too. It's not the same thing. I, I am more of a parent to this kid than I am a older sibling or, or you know friend or any of that stuff. And so we all write what we know. And the loser uncle who has his eyes opened by a child, I mean, that's obviously autobiographical. And so that's what you know. It's happened to you several times now. So but far. I hope, you know, that, that people like the story. And like I said, the, the boy talks now and he's just, he's a normal person he's in preschool but i have this snapshot in the baby fish mouth story <laughs> of when he couldn't talk and everybody else had passed him by and you know i was worried about him i know it's you know my mom was worried my sister was worried that you know what if he never catches up what if he's got a problem his whole life and all that and so you know that's where this story came from it's very interesting. It's cool to have that kind of stuff. There's several stories that I wrote like that from the past. Back in the day, I wrote stories where some of the children were just basically my children. And I even put little quirks and things that they did into those characters. And it's fun to read those again and be, oh, yeah, I remember when they used to do that. So it's, it's, it's a cool thing to have for sure. Uh, okay, I think we've come to the end of our conversation for today. Hopefully people enjoyed the story or have questions about the story and we can continue the conversation on the forums. Right. So if, if you've got anything to say, uh, jump on there and give us a message and we'll keep talking. Thanks a lot for listening, everybody, and uh, for bearing with us. <coughs> Oh, so. and now it's time for our new segment called Pimp My Right. Oh, you're right. Sorry. Thanks, announcer man. We're, we're, so that's what we're changing the name to now? Okay, but we're stuck with this one. I mean, this is what it will be called from... I doubt it. How on. All right. Uh, is, is it your turn? No, I think it's yours. So I have to promote something. Okay. You, you, you'll, you'll remember this. You used to tell me stories about your wife t uh, talking in her sleep uh -huh. a lot and that she would have no memory the next morning uh -huh. of the things that she'd said to you. Entire conversations where you thought that she was awake. She seemed to be awake. And I mean, after you'd been married for a long enough time, you realize, OK, she's not really awake. She's not going to be able to. She's not going to have any memory of this the next day, which is weird. But it, it got me thinking. And I thought, well, what if she said stuff that she couldn't possibly know? What if she said something to you? And it changed everything. It opened your eyes. It opened your mind. But the next morning, she doesn't know what you're talking about. So I wrote a story called Sleep Talking Gal about a man whose wife talks in her sleep and starts saying things, things about the future, things that are going on that she can't know. And uh, it's out there if people want to buy it. And uh, you probably should get um, 
some kind of residual on it, but you're not going to. <laughs> and uh, you can buy it uh, over on Amazon.com, or you can actually buy the audio. I've done an audiobook version of it uh, over on Audible.com. And I've only done this with a couple of my pieces, but I'm going to continue to try and put out more and more. It's just that I have obligations of, you know, other people's books that I should be getting to. And, you know, I should be doing those. It's just sometimes <laughs> easier to say, well, if I do this. I should get double residuals because I also did your cover art, sir. Did you do the cover art? I did. What did you do? I helped you find the girl the in black and white the with her arm over her eyes. That's right. See, that's what I wanted to do. So many times I know what I want for the cover art. But I can't do it. I can't mentally project this image from my head and say that's the cover art. And so, yeah, just story after story sits on my hard drive waiting for cover art. So there you go. I should get double residuals because it wouldn't be published. I hadn't thrown together that awesome cover art for it's, you. It's so true, but we had again, you get nothing. You get less than nothing. <laughs> I didn't even thank you for doing the cover art. So and I never you cursed will. me. But if people want to go out and check that out, I don't think I'll be doing that one on the Rish Outcast. But it's there, and I would appreciate it if people bought it. And uh, more importantly, I would put out more stuff there if people said that they liked it. There you go. If you want to hear more, then you know how to get it. There you go. And, yeah, of course, uh, Baby Fish Mouth is out there if you want to buy that story in text. But you'd have to look under the title Say Uncle. Oh, that's right. Yes, you published it under the title Say Uncle. Because Baby Fish Mouth was sweeping the nation and you didn't want it to be too trendy. Oh, but Baby Fish Mouth is sweeping the nation. <laughs> oh, nation. Baby Fish Mouth. Which should be funnier, but I'm starting to get sick again. So. <laughs> All right, we will end the show. Okay, well, I guess uh, that's the end of that. Well, it's only the beginning. We've only just begun. That's right, it's just the start of it's January. It's 2015, and... Uh, Gosh, imagine. Here's one little, another diversion. Imagine the stories you're going to write in 2015. Stories that you haven't even come up with yet. Yeah. Speaking of time travel, wouldn't it be neat to go to the end of 2015 and read some of these things that you've accomplished and be like, holy cow, I came up with this story? I didn't know it was going to end that way. I surprised even me. Maybe that's just a really masturbatory thought. I, I, <laughs> I apologize if it was. Please turn away. <laughs> and I will, uh, you know, slink back into the yeah, darkness. I'm, I'm suddenly very embarrassed and shame filled. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for listening, tuning in, and, and hearing the story and listening to the end of the show. We'll see you guys next time. I'm Big Anklevich. And I'm Rich Outfield. Your mountain is waiting, so get on your way. That's right. And why not do that? Yeah, yeah you should. for listening to The Dune Steve. The Dune Steve is released under a Creative Commons attribution, non-commercial, no derivatives license. So you can give it to anyone, but you cannot change it or make money off it. Believe me, we know that from experience. Lovely. Take two. I'm trying to think of a really bad time travel movie. Now. <laughs> There's lots, but I can't think of any that are is really Is Peggy really Sue bad. Got Married? I've never really seen that one. Peggy Sue Got Married is she travels back into her own body when she was in high school. Yeah. I and never saw that. She's got so. like a failed marriage and she's married to Nick Nicholas Cage, who's like an alcoholic douchebag and all that stuff. And suddenly she's in high school. And, you know, he's asking her out for the first time or whatever, and she's got the chance to fix everything. Nobody ever talks about Peggy Sue Got Married. Where the hell did that come from? Oh, Good I was just, job. Just, just thinking of that one. That's a really bad time travel movie. I don't know. It's hard to do time travel poorly. Time Cop. Well, it's only bad. Cause it's because Van it's Van Damme. Truly charisma-free Jean-Claude Van Damme in it, but... I think the premise for Time Cop was wonderful, dude. What was that Disney movie? It was the astronaut in King Arthur's Court or something. Oh, a kid like. in King Arthur's Court. You know, that one's really bad. So that Is one, it? That's the one that we should use, but that's not the one I'm thinking of. It was from the 70s. Oh. And a guy goes up in a spaceship, 
and you know relativistic flight takes him back in time and he lands in uh, unidentified flying oddball is that what it is <laughs> that is a disney movie i just can't that is, i don't that's i've never it. seen it <laughs> spaceman and king arthur also oh, also known as the spaceman and king 1979 Okay, that's what I'm going to say. Or should I say a kid in King Arthur's Court? That's way lamer, right? I never saw it. I, I was It was during that period when I was in my 20s. And I was like, I'm too cool for a movie for little kids. Yeah, it was, it was lame. We'll okay. just say that. I mean, after you'd been married for a long enough time, you realize, okay, she's not really awake. She's not going to be able to have any memory of this. Have we had this conversation? Have I plugged Let's talk talking gal? No, I don't think so. I think the deja vu, deja vu. I think the deja vu uh, that you're experiencing is because we mentioned this same scenario in our last episode when you talked about uh, how you took your Nyquil and uh, fell asleep and didn't remember telling me that you were sleepy and you couldn't do an episode. Okay. Which I, I I took a Nyquil while we were recording that episode, so I had no memory of us having a conversation about that. <laughs> there you go. I mean, it's indulgent as f, but of course it is. It's, it's your story. <laughs> yes. Do you want to do a podcast? Do you want to do a show? That better not be you, Big. Do you want to do a podcast? It could open many doors. And by the time it ends, we'll make loads of friends. Not to mention all the whores. F*** off! Okay, bye.